Welcome to the annual DEF CON convention. This meeting was held in exciting Las Vegas, Nevada from July 9th through the 11th, 1999. This is video tape number 21, Introduction to TCP IP Exploits. Okay, next up is Pete Shipley. He's going to elaborate on what I just talked about. He's going to be talking about TCP IP and its weaknesses. Let's give him a round of applause. One down. I'll leave it. Yeah, it's not going anywhere. He's not melting. Oh, that's keyboard mic. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about job stuff. Uh, let's see. What's... There we go. We're back. Okay, I'm just review a little bit of what Puck has talked about, then go on explain the general exploits you're seeing about every other day on bug tracks. If you are a security expert, I'm going to bore you to death. Um, this is newbie track. Uh, the purpose of this newbie track is so you don't have to ask stupid questions, we'll answer them for you. Uh, what we're basically covering here is what's TCPIP, why do we need it, um, basically what are ports and sockets, known problems, and um, basically general attack methods. Uh, if you're awake during the last hour, you already know this, what TCP is, set of protocols, ARPANET basically became the internet, all that fun stuff. And I'm going to skip over the first several slides, obviously, since it's kind of redundant from Pungus's talk. Uh, we have basically your... Uh, Too much to try calling me during my talk. Um, <laughs> basically, if you use the internet, you use TCP/IP. That's just the way life is. What is IP? It's basically a collection of protocols uh, that compromise the suite. This is, uh, in fact, well, well, you were at the last talk. Let me try to skip this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's the ISO stack. I'm going to, the reasons up here, you should actually know the ISO stack. I think it's for bullshit. You know, reminds me of a seven layer burrito. But, um, <laughs> in fact, layer one is your, you know, layer one is basically your physical. That's your physical. That's your actual wire. Layer two is the protocol on the wire, typically Ethernet. Three, we're talking about IP. On top of that, it's TCP. And then we jump up to six, which is probably application. Now, I want you to keep an eye on this because as I talk about various exploits, I'm probably going to work from the top down. What I'm going to do is point out, because everybody keeps saying, oh, what we're going to do is we're going to write a secure program. Well, so I break the its foundation, the transport layer. Well, I'm going to write a secure transport layer. So I break the network layer. You go, well, we're going to use uh, you know, better IP authentication. Well, I'll just break your link layer. This is what's happening in security continuously, and that's what I'm going to try to point, point out in this talk while explaining things. But everybody understands this, right? Good. Now, one nice thing what TCP does is provides a uh, connectionless, basically provides reliable connections over connectionless protocol. Uh, as you know from this talk, it basically relies on three-way handshaking. I'm going over this again because it's important that you understand this part. This is sure both sides agree that, hey, not only are we ready to talk, but we're going to talk. Like, for example, I go, hey, Punkus. He goes, hey, Pete. We've established a communication. I've called him. He acknowledges my, you know, my request to him, and we continue communication. That's exactly what three-way handshake is. So we have a client and server. I send a SYN packet. That's basically you know, SYN equals X. That is acknowledged with an... So the acknowledgement is a SYN plus one, and it also establishes a sequence. Now at this point, that second sequence is acknowledged. Point out here. I mean, again, we send out this. Now, the sequence in this direction is x, and the sequence in this direction is y. 
Now let me understand that. This is how we establish that somebody asked me during the break, well, how do you, when you have randomized sequences, how do you know which sequence to use? Well, what is the starting sequence? That's the important part. Questions? Interrupt me anytime for the question. Okay, with three-way handshakes, we basically, again, reiterating this so you understand so you don't get lost in five minutes. That we now all agree that both sides are exchange data and we have fun. Now, how, how do connections fail? That's actually kind of simple. Here we are on a client and server. I send a sin. It sends a reset. Yeah. Basically says, no thanks. That's, this, 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 oh, mind you, this is an oversimplified case, but in general, that's hopefully the way it's going to work. Unfortunately, IP stack is susceptible to tons and tons of, while well, possible, attacks, vulnerability, and spoofs. And that's what the remainder of this talk is about. If there any questions at all, please just interrupt. I mean, if I get ahead of you, just say so. Now, before we go on to attacks, we should talk about what kind of attacks exist. Uh, one frustration I see is like, oh, I've got a new exploit. It's a denial of, it's a, denial of service attack. The important thing is you need to classify your attacks. So in general, I find there's four types. There's disclosure information, that's theft of information. You know, getting your info file, getting, you know, getting your credit report. There's destruction of data, you know, erasing your files. Alteration of data, changing your grades. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah. So this again, well, for disclosures, attacks against confidentiality of data, stealing it, exposing things, releasing Quake before it's ready. Uh, password sniffers, email sniffers, this is all uh, disclosure information. Destruction is wiping. Alteration uh, is basically modification of data. It doesn't have to happen on disk. It could actually happen on a network. While you're, logged into a, while you're logged in from a client to a server, for example, someone might insert data. That's alteration of data. And the most common is denial of service. This is where these script kiddies think they're hackers because they could just flood your network. No, that is not a break-in. That's denial of service. That's the fourth type. Now, uh, what types of DOS attacks exist? Well, we have ping flooding. Then there's modification, echo reply flooding. I'll, I'll explain these terms in the next slide or two. Uh, TCP looping, ping of death, sin, fragment overflow. I'm going to explain all these talks. I mean, all these exploits to you. Uh, ping flooding is the most simple one. That's when you just basically you know, send lots and lots and lots of pings. Just run ping dash f from the Unix shell, give it an IP host name, and the machine that you're on sends as many packets as possible to a remote site. Um, effectively allows the, basically allows the attacker to possibly inhibit network activity. Mind you, this is not going to work in your dial-up to my home T1. <laughs> yeah. It will work from my T1 to your dial-up. And those out here, the OC48, don't take out my T1. <laughs> High bandwidth piece, low bandwidth. I have a friend who works at a um, large web development company, and they've got like several OC48s. And it's kind of humorous because people try to flood them out on IRC all the time. It's just a waste of time. <laughs> okay, and uh, well, another method is sending ping packets. You know, basically, you send any kind of packet. But the ping program comes with Unix, so it's, you know, you know, why write code where you just type ping dash f? Well, if you, if you really want to flood people out, you wouldn't use ping because routers are going to filter that. Now, how does it work? Simple. You know, I'm sending back to the internet, it's flooding your machine. No brainer. <laughs> uh, to be effective again, I want to reiterate, you need greater bandwidth. I reiterate this because I don't know how many kitties and their dial ups try to flood my home T1, it just doesn't work. Um, one common trick is if you're being flooded a lot, you will modify your firewall to say, for example, to block ICMP echo packets. Well, in that case, the person can start setting reply packets. If that doesn't work, they can literally start spawning a whole bunch of other, you know, host and reachable packets, just random UDP packets. Now, my main problem is low power bandwidth. That you have a small bandwidth, I have greater bandwidth. Well, how do we abuse this? Well, we can abuse other people's bandwidth. Now, as you know, ping is a simple program where you send out a packet and you get a reply back. Well, it comes back to you because you send it from your address. Here's the situation. There's my little notebook on the bottom. There's a bunch of badly set up machines on the right, and of course, a nice little victim I want to take out. Now, a smurf attack is simple. I send a single spoofed packet to that network. The broad, this is destined to a broadcast address. 
of that was covered, but when you transmit, uh, we have IP addresses, you transmit to a single host, and you also transmit to all hosts on a network. If you're dumb enough to leave your gateway open to allow inbound broadcast address, you're going to have problems. And uh, also, not only you have problems, but other people will have problems from you. So when the government starts calling you up and why you're flooding their network, somebody's probably using you as that group of hosts on the, on the right. Now, I said one packet to that group of systems. What do all those hosts do? They reply. A lot. <laughs> So again, I iterate, one packet, <laughs> many packets. This is a classic Smurf attack. Now, if I'm say, so this is where your 14.4 modem can wipe out somebody's large net connection. Again, uh, flood attacks are easy to do. You usually do it by filtering ICMP echo apply packets. The annoying part is you start filtering those, you can't ping people from your site. Other forms. Well, we have UDP echo spoofing. I'll uh, explain this. You all know what UDP is now. Well, we have echo spoofing. Uh, there's a nice little uh, port. There's a whole bunch of little ports called you know, internal services that come with your Unix machines and NT machines, one of which is echo. Uh, you, you tell it to that port, and whatever you type gets typed back at you. If you send a UDP packet, it'll transmit the packet back to you. Kind of a ping-like thing, but it's a different layer of service. I don't know why it's there anymore. It's uh, more of a legacy service. If, you, uh, if any brings it all, you automatically turn this off. But we can have fun. Like, there's a little NT box over on the right-hand side. They, put a, they installed all the network services, including UDP Echo. So, me being a nice person on the left, I send a UDP packet with a from address and to address of my victim. So where does my victim send the reply? Thus, <laughs> what is that machine busy doing with all of its CPU time? <laughs> this can go on for quite a while. Eventually, CPU time maxes out. You drop a packet and it goes away. Another method I can send for, I can use a source address of localhost, which is, again, kind of a uh, unique, unique host that always refers to yourself. And uh, some mobile packets. The machine keeps quite busy. Variations include transmitting to a broadcast address. We get a lot of machines broadcasting at each other and such. But it's kind of simple. There are patched versions of iNetD. That's the uh, daemon that spawns most of your you know, internet network services under Unix. There are patched versions that will block these attacks, as in, I'm not talking to myself. Screw this. Ignore it. Yeah, that type of thing. IP filtering helps unprotected systems. You know, I hope you all have a firewall. Uh, Cyber who flaked out in his early morning talk will be re it's rescheduled. He's going to drop his PKI talk and he's going to talk about his how to build a firewall out of BSD. That's going to be at 5 o'clock in this room. And uh, when he come, when, if you do attend that talk, ask him where he was this morning. He's out shooting his guns instead of talking to you. So give him lots of hell for that. <laughs> now, sin flooding. We all read the paper a few years ago. Sin flooding has actually been around for, I don't know, about 15 years. Although a couple years ago, Route actually released a public program, and um, all of a sudden, all the script kiddies can do it. And all the script kiddies think it's new technology. You know, read a paper from ten, security paper 10 years ago. It's all talked about. In fact, all the attacks were talked about 15 years ago. Uh, here we are. Basically, sin flooding allows attacker to die a system. Attacks per poor basis. You can read. Now, the way is that now the way this simply works. Again, we have my attacker system, non-existent, legitimate client. Uh, it used to be that most implementations of IP could only allow a certain number of starting connections. Now they can have an infinite amount of current connections, but only a small amount of pending connections. So if, I, so if you only allowed n pending connections, I could pick somebody and I go, hi. And this person says hi back to me, but I don't respond to that. Third person does it, fourth person does it. Now his buffer is full of pending inbound connections. And anybody else says hello to him, he won't respond because he's too busy waiting for a acknowledgement from me and the other people. You understand? Hello? So I sin flood that system. Now remember the three way handshake. It sends all the acts to a non existent into a, into a black hole, a non existent system. Now, that victim system is waiting for the acknowledgement to its acts. Are they going to come? No, we have to time out first. So, since nobody can establish a new connection, 
A legitimate client cannot connect. Now, if you log into the victim system, everything's just fine and dandy. Your, your shell's working, you're typing away. Your know, machine's load is nothing. But nobody else can establish any new connections. What's the typical uh, it varies on a, it varies per host. It's usually I think I believe on forty five seconds puckus. The average. It um, it pretty much varies a lot per host. There's a lot of software out there actually. More advanced firewalls these days will detect this. And you know, in the middle of attack or victim system, the of uh, an intelligent firewall or perhaps certain type of security utilities will start transmitting the resets, causing all the acts to be uh, reset. So. Um, destination hosts and reachable, it depends on your firewall. Some firewall types by default just say host and reachable for any packet they reject. Some firewalls don't reply anything. Other firewalls say network and reachable. It really depends on what product or whose uh, security company you bought into. Uh, the fire, hopefully the firewall that will reset will actually retransmit the connection. Again, it really depends on your product. I can't say what will what happen. In most of my examples here, we're assuming there's no firewall involved. And of course, you can't make the connection. In this remote access victim systems block, it takes very little bandwidth. You and your little dial-up or your ricochet modem can uh, take out entire corporations this way. This assumes that you're running a like, you know, old version of Solaris or SunOS. Any modern system in the basically released in the last year or two is listened to this. Let's run NT. <laughs> Again, strong filtering helps. Sin sniping. This is a fun one. Ever like be on a network and want to like shut people down? Well, this is how you do it. Here's that layout again. Here's that sin packet again. Now remember how the, the three-way handshake, you remember how normally a connection fails? Now you'd assume the reset would come from the person receiving the connection to serve on the right. Instead, I fake the reset. The legitimate client doesn't know any better. Sin, reset, okay, port not open. Now when the act does come along, the legitimate client sees the sin part of that and says, reset. <laughs> Both machines did not establish TCP connection, then there are no errors in your logs. Actually, if you're running a little program with ARP Watch, it's kind of fun because ARP Watch would notice that your um, effectively that your re the spoofed reset came from a wrong MAC address, but that could be fooled also. Yes. Huh? Um, these old machines are on the same physical wire on the same unswitched uh, dumb hub, and the attacker sniffed, you know, sniffed the packet and said, oh, here it is, reset. By the way, sequence number of the reset is zero. For your sequence number by default is zero unless you've established a sequence. So in theory, uh, the attacker can stream resets of sequence zero at the legitimate client, and a connection can never be established. Again, uh, the victim system can be selectively blocked. It requires, uh, as I pointed out, uh, local or intermediate network access. In other words, you have to be on one of the physical wires that this packet is traveling over to see the packets going back and forth. And it's pretty hard to uh, detect because you can always spoof it. You can basically spoof your MAC address, spoof your IP, spoof the IP address, obviously. It's kind of a bear to track down. <laughs> Smart hubs help. Buy your Cisco Catalyst. Nice little VPN networks. Spoof, you know, spoof protection, that'll help a lot. And we don't know, but then of course I'd rather buy a nice car than a decent, you know, 5500. Or a fully loaded Catalyst 2500 is like 110,000. Yes. Yeah. Security is expensive sometimes. Uh, ping of death, we all know about this one. It's really simple. This is a commonly implemented, it can be any type of IP packet, but it's commonly implemented as a ping. Uh, it implements a bug in layer three. Now, in all protocols, or most packet protocols, there's a concept of maximum size packet. In Pink of Death, the, the error was, we would allocate a packet size that's uh, you know, 
65K. And then I would transmit a ping packet, which was fragmented. When you reassembled all the parts of that packet, it was larger than a buffer. So you see the first fragment, you write it to the buffer. You see the second fragment, write it to the buffer. You see the third, write it to the buffer. You see the fourth, over the edge. And you overwrite parts to your system or kernel memory, aka blue screen of death. This worked on about every machine out there for a while. Again, this has been known for about a decade, only really, only really came to public light about a year or two ago. Basic options, if you have a firewall of control of, filter fragmented packets. There's no reason to allow a fragmented packet through your network. Well, you might say, why? Well, why should a packet be fragmented? If you have a healthy network going over a healthy internet into, a, into your healthy network, fragmentation should not happen. The only time fragmentation can possibly happen if you have a large packet network, for example, FTDI, being retransmitted over Ethernet, which has a smaller which has smaller packets, at which point they're fragment. But if you configure your network to do that, you should suffer. <laughs> uh, again, so just filter fragmented packets. I think on the average, if you run a website, you lose you can lose up to ten percent of. Uh, I think it's maximum ten percent of the people trying to connect to you. Sometimes as low as two percent. As far as I'm concerned, tough. They have a broken network. Now, permutations of this, teardrop attack. This, uh, and uh, so we have IP fragment flooding, that is uh, microfragments overlapping. This is fun stuff. Overlapping fragments are fun. Effectively, teardrop is a widely available tool. Anybody can download it. Root shell, I kind of hate root shell for this because they have umpteen versions of teardrop, yet they don't say what the teardrop attack is. Wouldn't it be nice for those hacker websites out there actually bother to write even a paragraph to say what it is so I don't have to come up here and explain them to you? <laughs> no, that might take effort. <laughs> Uh, this is mostly uh, Linux, NNT, Linux and NT, basically Linux and Windows are mostly vulnerable to this. Um, Linux should be upgraded, perhaps FreeBSD. <laughs> <laughs> and if you want FreeBSD, we have free CDs in the conference area. <laughs> Linux, yeah, unlike Linux, FreeBSD is free. <laughs> How much is Red Hat? <laughs> they jacked up the prices, actually. And by the way, they wouldn't make any available for free at DEF CON. <laughs> and another, another, well, I can, I'm not going to rank on them too much. I'll do that in the bar later. <laughs> okay, again, IP filtering helps. Uh, generally what happens is you have a badly formed fragment. So you have one fragment comes in. You have a badly formed packet that comes in. It tries to process the packet. The machine burps. In other words, it wasn't analyzing the fragments as it came in. It made the assumption that the offset in the packet was correct. It would, uh, well, inside the packet in a fragment, you effectively, I, was, I didn't, I kind of skipped that and Punk's is talking up for, up for breakfast, so in case he explains it to you, I'm sorry. But effectively, in a packet, you, if you're fragmented, there's an offset reference. Well, if that offset reference doesn't match the content of the packet, your program might be, might be tricked into doing something wrong and blowing up. Uh, another fun thing, this is not in my slides, but one great way you used to be able to take out Cisco routers about eight years ago, is on I, in IP, you have lots of variable options. And the way the header assembles is there's a byte offset to next option. And the way the computer works is, you know, take current address, add option, you know, add offset, and process current option. If you set that byte to zero, what does the machine do? Reprocess that option until the <laughs> power goes out. <laughs> you know, on a single threaded TCP IP stack like Linux, you could really uh, wave the uh, be your machine really just comes to a, it just literally stops. If you're multi-threaded, uh, you know, multi-threaded like any uh, Slayer's or BSD machine, it's not a problem. It'll just eat up a thread, which will eventually die. Again, uh, fragment flooding is another fun one. When fragments come in, as you, as you realize, you need to deal with these things. Sometimes fragments don't show up in order. So you're getting snippets of articles coming in, snippets of packets. So you've got to store them in memory somewhere until the other part comes up. You connect them together and then pass it on to the upper layer, you know, to the application layer. What if I send lots and lots of random fragments to your machine? What happens to your RAM space? It fills up with useless garbage. NT, really vulnerable to this. Um, 
Linux and the BSDs are actually fairly good about this. Uh, when they begin to run out of memory, they start just dumping the packets. You know, you know, because if the packet, what happens is, if this packet wasn't properly acknowledged, it would be retransmitted, resent. It's not a problem. But there's a good way of uh, eating up lots of CPU resources and uh, run out of RAM real fast. In other words, microfragments. Let's make fragments so small you don't recognize what they are. So if I fragment, now mind you, we had the TC, we had you know Ethernet, IP, TCP. If you're filtering at the TCP layer, it's assumed you could read the entire TCP packet, at least the header part. Or what if I fragment my packet so small you can't read the header as a full part? Do you still filter? No. What do you do? Well, you probably pass it through. So what you do is you just fragment your packet so small, each one is not identified as a problem. Simple. Yes? A firewall policy of dropping off fragments would help a lot. Uh, certain firewalls actually do reassembly. I believe the, the uh, Cisco had a firewall that essentially discontinued. The, uh, the NT-based one. Sen yeah, Sentry was pretty good because the Sentry actually had a, poly had a, a packet fra fragment packet policy that would reassemble fragments for passing them on. Actually pretty good. It was a bit memory intensive, but it worked. Uh, most other firewalls will simply uh, forward the fragments. Uh, the PIX firewalls option is only pass fragments when they come in order. So the, obviously the micro fragments may or may not work. Actually, I think it just drops those. The overlapping fragments and the uh, fragment flooding would not work because it only allows fragments in order. Mind you, this breaks Linux because when Linux fragments, it breaks a packet maybe three parts. It says the last part first and the first part last. So the PIX firewall simply drops the packet because it gets, you know, gets fragments, you know, you know, four, then three, then two, then one. When it gets packet four, it goes, where's three, two, one? Ditch it because this is a random fragment. I don't know if that's a bug in Linux or a bug in PIX, but oh well. Questions? Okay, other fun things. You want to worry about sniffing? Yeah. Yeah, you get your password stolen? <laughs> Up cache poison is a fun one. Now mind you, so far, if you want to work my way down that protocol stack. Every time I explain a fix, you know, I'm going to break it again in about five minutes. <laughs> now Sniffy is a fun one. Don't you love the little number on the bottom? 85 to, you know, 95 percent of attacks. I love these kids that call themselves hackers because they get, they break into one ISP, steal passwords, break into another ISP, steal passwords. When are they actually showing technique? Now sniffing is easy for the person who hasn't figured it out yet. It's simply the intersection of data. As client sends a server, my notebook sitting on your machine has your password. Anybody use any of these any of these applications or protocols? Hands? Come on! Your password has been stolen. Telnet, clear text, unencrypted. Our login, clear text, unencrypted. Well, pop, IMAP, clear text. APOP is kind of, if you're using APOP, okay, then you're a little bit safer. I can only read your mail, I can't read your password. Uh, HTTP. You know, you, uh, when your little dialog box pops up, you type your name and password, clear text. <laughs> FTP, clear text. Simple mail transfer, clear text. Simple network management, clear text. RPC, NFS, clear text. All of which are available to be listened to over your network. You guys secure? Uh, have you used SSH? <laughs> yeah. uh, SSL will, be, will provide encryption. Although one minor plug again or four against SSL. SSL simply means the person cannot listen to your packets between you and the server. It does not mean the server is secure. One of my pet peeves like, we're secure, we use SSL. That doesn't mean they're secure. It means that the data getting to them is encrypted. The second is handed off to their applications is clear text. This is again, just to name a few, be aware. Download SSH, download secure, you know, secure CRT, use it. If your ISP doesn't support it, tell them to. If they don't, get a new ISP. Best protection, buy a smart hub. 
I know, it's kind of expensive, but you got to do it if you're going to be serious. Use SSH, use Kerberos, that's kind of nice. There's DES Telnet, but it's not really widely distributed as it should be. Uh, whenever possible, remove promiscuous mode. On my home site, you can't sniff. I've rebuilt all my kernels, and I remove the capability from sniffing from my kernels. Go ahead, root my system. P people do all the time. You can't sniff. <laughs> Makes your network a little bit more secure. Well, to rebuild the kernel would be kind of nice, but you got to replace the kernel. But because it's an uh, immutable file, you need to reboot the machine from console and install it. <laughs> Which is kind of a pain in the ass, because I have to be there at console to install it. <laughs> Maybe by cow lots of beer, I'll stick it in the war room and do it for me, but I don't know. Let's see, but on local ethernet, this common um, MAC address poisoning. I love this. Mike talked about all the different ways about TCP IP and how you can fool things and redirect things. Well, let's go one layer. Let's go like layer two. Ethernet level. Press anybody to impersonate anybody on your local LAN. Hmm. Yeah, I love it. We have a secure IP coming out. We're doing all the secure stuff with IP. We're encrypting our packets and everything else. Well, it's too bad. I just blew your foundation away. Uh, denial of service is a lot of redirects. Now, how does our cache work? Well, you're on a network. Every network, every Ethernet card has, in theory, a unique MAC address. And also a lot of unique IP addresses. Hopefully it's a unique IP address. So how do the machines figure out who's who? Well, some called ARPs. So, host um, you know, 3.4 does a transmit. Hey, who's 3.8? That's a broadcast over the local Ethernet. That machine replies, hey, that's me. Oh, fee notification, that's a uh, MAC address number. The first several bytes are, you can pretty much tell what kind of host I'm working with here by looking at the first several bytes. I'll leave that to your own uh, figuring out what kind of machine I have at home. And the second set of bytes are the host type. But by just looking at the MAC address, you can tell the hardware type. So, in the case of a break-in, what happens? Here we, are that, here we are with that little transmission. Hey, who is this person? I lie. <laughs> Where do the IP packets go? <laughs> Straight down. Oh, by the way, Loft will be announcing a product this weekend. Um, if you're interested in this stuff, look for the announcement. So, our cache poisoning. Buy a smart switch, buy a smart hub. Oh, one more quick thing about this. You don't have to wait for the request. A lot of applications will just take accept the packet. If you just get on a network and say, hi, I'm the new router here, I'm, yep, I'm this manager writing address. A lot of machines are like, oh, okay, update the cache and start sending information to you. <laughs> and of course, I don't believe in handout things on handout fixes. Again, mortgage the house by a smart hub or a switch. <laughs> Whenever possible, remove some promiscuous mode from your kernel, that's like a broken record. When network ARP watch is really good. ARP watch is a program that a friend, uh, friend of mine wrote. It basically listens to your network and keeps a table of IP addresses to Ethernet addresses. If someone get if a new one shows up, it sends a notification: "Hey, new IP address," or "Hey, new MAC address." If somebody uses somebody else's IP address, it goes, "Hey, that changed." So if I plug this my notebook into your into your network and start trying to take over your connectivity, take over your identity. What happens? At least I'll know about it. It's really good for people running large sites when people are, when you have employees bringing new computers in or moving computers around the network. It catches them real fast. On stable networks, in other words, places aren't being re-IP addressed all the time, go to your servers, preferably Unix. You can also do this on NT. Or you figure out where that menu is by yourself. And you can permanently insert into an ARP table. And that's the command ARP-S, IP address, MAC address, and pub. That'll permanently insert that MAC address into your kernel table, which means it'll ignore the broadcasts. If you have your mail server, your DNS server, all your different servers, I hope you're not running on the same machine. That's another foolish thing to do, but that's different talk. I hope each of your major network services runs on dedicated individual hardware. And I hope when you get home that you go in, you hard code your MAC addresses between servers. This way, no one can spoof. Mind you, when a machine crashes and you replace the Ethernet card, <laughs> life will be bad. <laughs> you have to go to every fucking machine and reprogram and redo your table. But good luck. <laughs> 
And this doesn't quite work with uh, you know, transit networks, DHCP based stuff. Yes and no. Most most cards, most newer cards, can actually have the MAC addresses change usually with programming. Uh, by default, the MAC address is assigned to the card unless you use Spark, so which points out is bound to the CPU. So it's kind of a pain. Yeah. So if you put two Ethernet cards into the same Spark station, they both have the same MAC address, and if you connect them both to the same Ethernet for some various reason, <laughs> things will get broken real fast. But uh, rule of thumb, it has you know it's, it's bound directly to the card. In fact, um, let's see. There are connections. Yeah, there are connections. But as rule of thumb, I mean, you look at your Ethernet card, and on the back, yeah. On the back, it says EA, and then my Ethernet address. Happens to be the same one in the slide. <laughs> but it's bound into your card. Now, sequence prediction. You know, you thought you had SSH. <laughs> Well, actually, this won't break SSH, it'll just make your life a little bit more annoying. But this is a good way of uh, trashing your telnet connections. Uh, talk to Route. Route will be happy to point you to the FRAC article that gave you the program to do this, no problem. Now, again, we have a bunch of hosts. And let's say I take out trusted hosts. So, sin flood. Bye bye. Yeah. Could be ping of death, you know, it can be, you know, the latest application, don't worry about that. But, okay, that machine is out. Next. I go, hi target, hi Pete. Now, so let's call it sequence one. Let's say call it the sequence number I gotta say would be 10. Next one, that's 12. 14. What's the next one gonna be? 16. So, what do I do? I send a spoofed packet. It replies to me as the 16. Using that, using that number, I can reply, even though I never saw the, the acknowledged sequence number. Again, we go, <laughs> we connect up, we send a few packets, we eventually we get, we actually we figure out what the sequence is, we find it's very predictable. Most new machines now randomize the starting sequence. But before, I mean, it was like clockwork. I mean, you ran our bone, there's one program, it was great, because it goes, you know, like, Current sequence, guess sequence, real sequence, and you just watch the numbers converge. And watch the number, and then once the numbers converge, the program just you root. <laughs> it was really funny. These numbers streaming up your screen, and you know, converging, and as when the delta hits zero, boom, you're in. <laughs> it's like in kind the of movies. So, <laughs> I love all the watching the hacker movies because you know these hackers put more time into the GUIs of the application. Than <laughs> I wish it's, I wish it, I mean, yeah, I wish I could download shit like that from other people, I mean. Yeah. But okay, but back here we send the spoofs in. It sends it to the, you know, since I spoofed it, sends it to the trusted host. By the way, by default, you'd think the trusted host would have sent a reset. But it's down. Can't send a reset. Which allows me to, do, mind you, you only get one packet. That's one of the problems. But that packet can be reboot. RM star. Send me a next term. Our host, you know, uh, defcon.org. You know, whatever you want it to be. All you need is one command. Follow? Questions? Now, let's see. Um, again, this is just an explanation. I was going to print out the slides, but it's too early in the morning to go to Kinko's and print them. Uh, these slides will probably be available on the defcon webpage. DT always seems to publish these things. But this is explanation of what I just said. OS is now randomizer numbers, makes it a little bit harder to do. It turns out but the, that some of the randomizations were very weak. So you know, even though it looked random, it wasn't random. Whoops. Crypto login helps a lot. Because under uh, crypto login, you, after you establish a three-way handshake, we need to still need the, the, you know, the encrypted, especially SSH example, we still need to perform the key exchange. So it's more than one packet. Yes? In uh, Slurs 2.6, there's two or three different Mm -hmm. There's one for standard stuff, which doesn't really randomize it. And there's one for RFC. Uh, somebody, yeah, somebody wrote it. RFCs are uh, basically in the documents that propose standards. And there's one, another one for randomizing the sequence. Do you recommend? Do you know about those? Um, 
I'm familiar with the different pro the propositions, I recommend using the RFC or the randomized one, not the non-randomized one. It's up to you. I imagine that the uh, RFC is a standard and the other one's a homebrew. I mean, if your network works, don't worry about it. And here we are, session hijacking. This is very similar to what I just did. Here's that slide again. Now, I'll save you the effort of seeing through your handshake. Let's just say it happened. You are happily logged into your ISP. You're on IRC, telnet it in, whatever else. And what happens? I spoof a packet, I hijack a session. Basically I, send a, basically, I know what your sequences are. I jump into the conversation midstream. We exchange a packet or two. All of a sudden, your trusted host is out of sequence, so it's going to be ignored. And I now have your teleconnection. The timing is tricky, that's why you use software. <laughs> Now, once I send that, I get some nuts. Now, the problem is you're going to have a act storm because uh, your target host is going to say he's not going to get acknowledgement for a packet it's sent, and it's going to start streaming acts at each other. Same thing for the trusted host, and eventually your connection will drop because it's, it's going to discover the act associated with that TCP, and your kernel's going to go, eh, something screwy here, kill connection. Now, a partial hack might be to send an ARP to the target host and make it send as acts to Never Neverland. That would be a pretty good one. That helps a little bit. So quick, quick explanation, I desynchronize the connection, then I jump into the sequence that I established, and uh, you're typing along, all of a sudden your screen doesn't respond anymore, and I've got the session on my notebook. The software is published with FRAC. Anybody feel, everybody going to use Telnet again? <laughs> anybody who used Telnet before and not again? And again, workers to house, <laughs> buy, a decent, buy a decent network equipment. Uh, port scans, we all know about them yet? Yeah, I'm going to go over them quickly because that's actually what the next talk's about. Uh, DNS cache point is a fun one. Did you notice that DEF CON uh, uh, webpage was down for a few, a few weeks ago? Mm, DNS cache poisoning. So uh, port scan is kind of easy. I'll kind of skip through this quickly because uh, this is actually what the next talk's about. Basically, I send a port to connection one, I get a reset, it's closed. Two, reset. Port three, reset, skip to seven. Open! I got ports open, port seven. Discard was open, 11 was closed, 20, FTP was open. This basically what happens when strobe or nmap. You and Strobe or NMAP? That's the next talk. <laughs> and I'm going to skip through this. I don't want to really tread all over uh, modify. And uh, there's different types of options. I'm going to skip through this because, again, I don't want to uh, take the window of somebody's sales. Hmm. See what we're doing? We're doing fine on time. And you basically, by the way, you don't have to do resets. No, I'll skip through this again. I don't want to take the window out. Um, you can spot this stuff. Here's a few applications. GCP log, netstat, abacus. Uh, those are little applications you can run on your server. Again, I'm skipping these slides. It's all next, it's all next hour. That's the fun stuff. DNS cache poisoning. Hmm. Everybody know about DNS or how it works? I'll tell you. Okay, here at the dot server, the com server, and the acme.com server. And of course, legitimate client and DNS server. Now this is a normal, healthy situation. Your client goes to your local DNS server goes, hey, where's acme.com? We send a packet off to the root of all internet called dot. He goes, hey, who's acme.com? I don't know, wanjas.com. Hey, who's acme.com? I don't know, wanjas acme. Hey, who is this person? Oh, the answer is, and it gets sent up with the proper IP address. Simple, huh? Now, it might seem inefficient, but actually what happens is um, your DNS server down here caches that information. So next time somebody asks, it's already in the cache. A little bit more efficient that way. Also causes some minor security problems. Vulnerability is a cache. You always insert erroneous information. Like, where did that reply actually come from? Here we are again. 
as, a, as an outside person, I go, hey, who's Equi.com? It goes, where is that? I reply. <laughs> it sends me the answer. That's obviously the wrong address. Gee, could that be the same IP address that www.defcon.org had maybe uh, three weeks ago? <laughs> I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> so what happens later on? Somebody else asks for it. You get that reply. Okay, what if we were talking Wells Fargo Bank? And that IP address was my home web server. What would happen when I ask for your password? You type it in. <laughs> and what happens when I ask you about your account number? You type it in. <laughs> then what happens? I go to jail. <laughs> 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 After paying for my death contract, <laughs> but uh, again, this, this, if you update the current versions, eight dot something by Paul Vixy, I recommend that. Uh, for the person who knows what I was talking about, yes, I know there's several permutations to this. It used to be um, when this whole little mess they started doing it. It used to be that DNS servers would only accept, you know, would only accept responses. It actually would just accept a response, actually. It wouldn't even care if it asked a question. It would just accept it. Well, yeah, oh, let's fix that. So now it only accepted responses for questions asked. Well, eventually you realize, well, we just asked the question first. So uh, the ENSO goes, fine, we'll start sequencing our requests and making sure the answer is the same sequence. That didn't work. Uh, the sequences are A, very predictable. B, you're able to uh, and send all the possible sequences in the, within a minute anyway, so. I mean, you know, the sequ what is it? The sequences are, how long does it take to send like 65,000 packets? <laughs> Not long. And so they took care of that. So now they theoretically randomize the sequence, but it turns out the, the sequence randomization is not that random. Yeah, so it's a little th thing going here, but run the latest version, it's a lot better. And next version, we're actually going to have encryption. That'll help a lot. Yes? Um, in earlier, right, yes and no. Uh, in this case, we're assuming you're actually going to ask it. Yes, it will ask it, but a lot of times we'll send a packet, ask, at least send a packet out asking for what's the current version of IP address called the SOA record, which is a serial number. And if I reply with a higher serial number, I could overwrite it. So when I fake, when I send that little fake packet, it's going to have a serial number of nine million nine hundred ninety-nine million, just you know, some astronomical number, and with an expiration date, will never time out. So that's going to be in your cache. They power down your server. And eventually, yes, if it's already in your cache, I might not get it in. But then, it's only, all I got to do is ask for another record that's not in your cache, and I can probably slip it in. One of the other exploits, of course, was uh, piggybacking. You know, so I run Disorg. That's my home domain, IP, you know, home domain. And I would, for example, get you to do a disorg lookup, and then my disorg reply would piggyback a Wells Fargo reply. That's another way of slipping past the gates. You know, again, I can, I can quite literally go on for an hour of just permutations of this one. So in, clo you know, in closing for this particular topic, we'll just say upgrade. Even if you just installed Solaris 7, upgrade. Whenever you buy a, a commercial product, download, install. Same thing with send mail. Uh, so let's say, so effectively upgrade, fix pending, you know, modern version tracks queries, etc. BGP, anybody know what that is? Yes, this is a fun one. We all talked about, uh, was it taking, killing the internet in 20 minutes? Want to know how to do it? Yeah. <laughs> actually, Disorder is, re is actually released some automated scripts for this one. Okay, here's a little network. We have an internal router, we have a couple peers. Uh, obviously, these people got money since they have multiple connections to the internet. Internal router establishes a BGP connection to the peer routers, little blue hours. I'm on the outside world. B, being a nasty sob, uh, forges reset and fin packets. Mind you, these are TCP connections. I don't know what the sequence is. But there's only 65,000 of them. How long is it going to take me? <laughs> now, eventually, that network goes out. When uh, internal router and router A 
discover a drop of TCP connection, internal and A assume the other guy crashed, automatically rebalance their internal uh, hash, their internal balance tree of routes. And if you're uh, anywhere near a large uh, hub or large center of the universe, that can take a long time and a lot of memory. And after it balances this, it reestablishes connection and then rebalances the tree. After the tree is balanced, then your connectivity. So your network can be down for up to 20 minutes. This is an extreme case, but it takes a while. So a peer loses BGP connection, you're screwed. You no longer have connectivity through that one peer. There's a blind attack of a 1 in 65,000 chance. Not a problem. Better than the lottery, better than the slot machine. Let's see, uh, attacker may be able to keep the connection down infinitely by continuously resetting uh, resets to zero. Again, what's the first sequence number? Zero. Until we establish a sequence, it's assumed to be zero. So when you send out the SIN, the reset is sequence zero since we haven't really established a full sequence. Um, the attacker may keep things down and eventually, um, when the routing table is large enough, it can take sequence time to come back up. So your network is up, what, three minutes every 10 minutes? Or worse? Your site's out of luck. You can really embargo a corporation this way. And uh, the network admins will go nuts because the routers are up, the routers are pinging each other. Your Cisco discovery protocol says, yep, I see a router right next to me, and you, you get the connection, it goes right back down, and they'll be pulling their hair all day to hook up a proper uh, network monitor. And uh, again, this attack is best fixed by filters. Unfortunately, uh, if I get to pick on Cisco, it's more actually most networks, you lose about 40% of your bandwidth when you turn on IP filtering. So since people only buy a big enough router that they need, nothing more, they discover they turn on IP filtering, the router isn't big enough, but they just pay, they spend how much money? So, there's a problem. Question? Yeah, how critical is that to you? Um, it take, well, since I'm probably spoofing, it's going to take a while. You probably have to manually do it. You really just can't say where this packet came from because the source address has, has wrong stamp on it. You probably have to call up each person in their chain of connections, hopefully not 255 hops, usually about 30, and get them to run a monitor and tell you where the packet's coming from. How often do they get to do that? I don't know. I don't work there. <laughs> It really depends. I don't want a subpoena first. It's all privacy versus uh, workability issue. Uh, it falls into Jennifer's, I guess, column. But this is a fun one. I just think, this was really was way too much fun. You know, we have IP filters, so bam. <laughs> Again, you know, it, the uh, internet's getting overloaded. The centralized hubs are just don't have enough bandwidth to support filtering. Most companies, the best thing you can do is if you have, if you run a company, you run an ISP, filter your outbound. There's no reason a packet should leave your network if it's not from your network. That being, have an outbound filter means that all packets leaving your net have a source address of your network.